Hello, this is Jürgen, and today I want to talk a little bit about how to work with Fibonacci numbers in Maple. So most people know what Fibonacci numbers are. Um, so there is a recurrence, uh, which I define here. So a Fibonacci number is the sum of its two predecessors, and we have two initial conditions, and uh, they, they can vary, but the, a nice way of picking the initial conditions is to say the zero the Fibonacci number is zero, and the first one is one. So this is something that Maple already knows about. So there's a Fibonacci command in the Combinat package. And uh, here's the sequence of the first 12 Fibonacci numbers. Those are exactly all the Fibonacci numbers with at most two digits. Now, the first thing we want to do today is uh, there is a number of useful formulas that Fibonacci numbers satisfy. Uh, and the ones uh, I'm I want to go through today are called the doubling formula. So I call them claim one and claim two because we, uh, we don't assume that they are valid, but we want to actually use Maple in order to prove those formulas. So you can see there is the first case is for um, odd Fibonacci numbers. So the left-hand side is odd when n is an integer. And the second claim is for the even case. So how do we do this in Maple? So we use, um, if we would do it uh, in, with pencil and paper, you would use um, induction and that's what we do here now. So we start with the base case n equals one. And for that, we first unroll the recursion formula, the definition, the defining formula for the Fibonacci numbers. That's 1.2 from above uh, for n equals one. And that gives us the first non-trivial Fibonacci number. We already know what F0 and F1 are. And this tells us that F2 has to be one. And then we evaluate both our claims um, for the base case n equals one. And we see that the first claim is trivially satisfied, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side evaluate to one. And the second claim uh, amounts to essentially what we just showed using the recursion formula. So the base case is easy. Um, so the next thing we want to do is the induction step. So we assume we already have proven both claims for n, and we want to prove them for n plus 1. So we start with the first claim, and we substitute, we replace n by n plus 1 in the formula. So this is what we want to prove. And now we apply the standard recursion formula for the Fibonacci numbers. But uh, so the recursion formula has f of n plus one on the left-hand side, but here we want something that has f of two n plus one on the left-hand side. So we need to take the recursion formula and replace n by two times n. And then we take that and plug it into our claim above. So that replaces the left-hand side by f of two n plus f of two n minus one. Um, now we use the uh, induction, induction hypothesis. So we have f of 2n and f of 2n minus 1 on the left-hand side. And those are exactly the ones that also appear on the left-hand sides of uh, the, the induction hypothesis for both claims. And what that does is get rid, gets rid of all the Fibonacci numbers that have a 2n in the argument. And all we have left is Fibonacci numbers that have only n or n minus one or n plus one in the argument. And now we can once more apply the standard um, recursion formula for the Fibonacci numbers to get rid of f of n plus one. Then we have something that only has f of n and f of n minus one left. And um, all that remains to do is simplify uh, this expression and take the difference of left-hand side and right-hand side and we get zero. And since all the transformations we've been doing are equivalence transformation, this means we have proved the, the induction hypothesis for the first claim. So what remains to do uh, is to do the same thing for the second claim. So this is what we want to prove. So now this has f of 2n plus 2 on the left-hand side. And again, we want to use the, re the recurrence relation to rewrite that in terms of f2n plus 1 and f2n. So that's what we get here. So now we apply the induction hypothesis for the second claim to f2 times n. And for f2 times n plus 1, we can not take the induction hypothesis because that has f2n minus 1. But we already proved the, uh, the, the claim for, that's what we just did. We proved this claim for f2n minus 1, so we can directly use it. And again, that gets rid of everything that has a 2 times n 
um, in the argument of the Fibonacci number, we apply the recurrence once more to get rid of n, n, Fn plus 1. And then we uh, take the difference of left-hand side minus right-hand side and simplify. So this concludes the proof. There's a, a more direct way. Um, so this is would be using Maple um, as an assistant to prove something that would, would normally proof uh, using pencil and paper. However, uh, what we can also do, we can put together all the equations that we, so this is not for the induct inductive step, uh, the base case would be done in the same way. So we put together all the equations that we used as well as the induction hypothesis. So the first two um, equations here are the induction hypothesis for the odd and the even case. And then the next two are just versions of the recurrence formula. So the third equation is just the recurrence formula itself. And the other two are the recurrence formula with n replaced by 2n and 2n plus 1 respectively. And now we can just use the solve command. So these are uh, five equations in seven unknowns. And we can, so we can express everything in terms of two, the unknown, two of the unknowns and the ones we choose are fn plus 1 and fn. So we tell uh, the solve command we want to solve all of these equations in terms of all the variables except fn plus 1 and fn. And so this is what we get in one fell swoop. The first two equations are exactly the uh, claims from the, uh, from the induction step. So that proves, concludes the proof. And in addition, we see some other formulas in there which are also interesting. So the last line is basically just a rewritten version of the induction of the recursion, the standard recursion formula. And then uh, we also get the claims back, um, but not expressing the left-hand side in terms of Fn and Fn minus 1, as we had from above, but in terms of Fn and Fn plus 1. So this was just to show how Maple can be used to prove a certain mathematical fact. What I want to talk about next is how to compute large Fibonacci numbers. And the first thing is, uh, since it's a recursive definition for the Fibonacci numbers, it's very easy to write a recursive uh, procedure as like the one above that recursively computes the Fibonacci numbers. And we can see that it works. Um, so this, these are the same 12 Fibonacci numbers which we've already seen before. But it's actually a very bad algorithm to compute Fibonacci numbers. And the reason uh, uh, is the uh, the resource consumption. So let's look at how much time and memory Maple uses in order to compute the 25th Fibonacci number. So that's still fairly quick. And the numbers are not big. But you can see as we go up to 28, 29, um, the CPU time goes up. And it doesn't double every time. But uh, there is a, a constant factor by which it's multiplied every time. And the same for the real time and the same for the memory. So for the 29th Fibonacci number, we are already using 100 megabytes of, of memory, and that seems like a lot. So the reason for this is if we go back and look at the code, there's a lot of things that are being recomputed over and over. So for example, for computing a Fib of n minus 1, we're uh, calling ourselves recursively and and unrolling the recurrence. And in doing that, we will also compute FIP of n minus 2. So FIP of n minus 2 will be computed twice. And uh, FIP of n minus 3 will maybe computed, will be computed three times, uh, or maybe even more, four times, five times, uh, actually Fibonacci number many times. So this is an exponential algorithm for computing Fibonacci numbers. Now, there is a better way. Uh, and in Maple, this can be done very easily by using something called option remember. This is a caching mechanism that would automatically cache any previously computed results. That's the only change to the procedure, uh, introducing this option cache. So it's very convenient. And now we have no problem computing a Fibonacci number uh, of index uh, 10,000 or 20,000. It's all very fast. And also the memory consumption is reasonably low. There's still megabytes being used, but now the numbers are much bigger than before. Here's an example with 100,000. And with 200,000, we get an error because our stack is overflowing. So it's still a recursive procedure, and there is a level in a, a, a limit in Maple as to how many recursive calls one can have. Um, in order to work around that, uh, that's a standard um, 
way of doing this is to convert the recursive procedure into an iterative one. And that's what we have here. And that has the advantage that the memory usage goes down. So if you look at the yellow step, we only need two um, very two locations for intermediate results and then we can compute the new one a plus b and we can discard the smallest one of the two which is a and uh, so just to check that this still gives us the Fibonacci numbers um, and now we can easily compute the Fibonacci number of index 200,000 500,000 um, but we see that it already takes some time to do that and it already takes some memory use, uh, also takes some memory. So to compute the latest one here, we see that Maple used about 10 gigabytes of memory. And the reason is, so we only need two places to store the numbers, but we also need to store the numbers themselves. So the numbers themselves have like uh, 100,000 digits, as you can see here. And we don't just have one of them, but we have about 500,000 of them. And the smaller one are smaller, but the larger one are larger. So maybe on average, they have something like 70,000 digits. So we need to store all of those numbers in memory. And that means uh, that the memory management uh, takes quite a bit of time. And there's also many computations that have to be done with all of those, with all those numbers. Okay, so what is the best way of computing Fibonacci numbers? So the best way is to use the duplication formula that we just proved. And I just want to state that here again so that we have it for reference. And then let's look at the procedure that um, computes the Fibonacci numbers using the doubling formula. So if n is uh, less than or equal to 1, then we just return n itself. So that, that's from the initial conditions that we have from the Fibonacci numbers. And then we have a case distinction depending on whether n is odd or even. And the, the, what you see in the algorithm is just a rewrite of the formulas above because in the formulas we have 2n and 2n minus 1 as the arguments, while in, in our procedure we have n. So we have to reparameterize those formulas so that everything works out. So 500,000 is the number that we had before, which was using 10 gigabytes of memory. And now we can compute this very easily with only 300 kilobytes and almost no CPU time. And com we can compute this huge number with 100,000 digits and no problem for 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, or even 10 million, 20 million, 50 million, um, 100 million. So memory usage goes up, but not by too much. It's reasonable and also the CPU time uh, goes up in, in a reasonable fashion. And this is just to, to verify, this is the that the method is actually correct. Uh, the, the number that we see here at the bottom is the number of digits we would expect the number to have, and we can see that it exactly matches what we computed. I'd like to conclude this um, recording by talking a little bit of, about a generalization of the Fibonacci numbers, namely the Fibonacci polynomials. So we have exactly the same initial conditions, f of 0 is 0 and f of 1 is 1. Um, but we have a recurrence formula that, that now involves a symbol x. So here's our first try of implementing such a formula. So uh, we're not using the duplication here um, for simplicity. We just use the regular recurrence formula, but with option remember. And so what we do is we just implement the recurrence formula. And here are the first 10 Fibonacci polynomials. And what you can see is that these are an unsimplified form. So we have to use the expand command in order to, uh, to multiply out all of these polynomials. And so that's the only change is that we're using the expand command and nothing else. And now if we do that, we can see a very nice simplified form for those Fibonacci polynomials. So what we can do now is to explore those polynomials a little bit, for example, by factoring them. So let's factor the first 20 Fibonacci polynomials. Maybe we can do this very quickly because the polynomials, it's not very hard, the polynomials have very low degree. And now we can look at those factorizations and there's a number of things that we can see um, except for a factor, potentially a factor of x, which only occurs in, in case the index is odd. There are no terms of odd degree in the factorization. Um, and in fact, um, 
yeah, so all, all the there are no factors of odd degree, and also in the factors of even degree, there are no terms of odd degree. Um, all the coefficients of these polynomials are positive. That's something that can be easily proved from the recursion formula. Um, zero is the only root um, of these polynomials. So whenever there is a factor x, then uh, zero is a root. Otherwise, since we the maple factor command always factors into irreducible polynomials, this is a proof that there are no other um, no other rational roots, and in, in fact, since all the polynomials have positive coefficients, there are no other real roots either. So every polynomial of even degree is actually a sum of squares. Um, the degree of the nth Fibonacci polynomial is n minus 1. That's also easy to prove from the occurrence formula. Uh, what's not obvious, um, but also at least for the initial cases that we're looking at here, um, is that um, the nth Fibonacci polynomial is irreducible whenever n is a prime. For example, the last one that you see here of degree 18, that's the Fibonacci polynomial of index 19, and 19 is a prime. And another thing that you can also see when you look at things is that uh, whenever um, a prime number divides a different number, then that Fibonacci polynomial also divides the Fibonacci polynomial of the of, of the multiple. Now these are all things that I don't want to go into further, but these are all things that one might explore and try to prove from play, just playing with these, uh, with these Fibonacci polynomials. So the last few things I want to show here is from the definition of the Fibonacci polynomials, again it's obvious that if we plug in the value x equals 1, we get back the regular Fibonacci numbers. And actually, both Fibonacci numbers and Fibonacci polynomials are already present in Maple. Uh, so I already used the Fibonacci command for the Fibonacci numbers. Um, but it actually can be called with two arguments, and then um, you get the Fibonacci polynomials. Um, one can also plot those polynomials. For example, using the explore command in Maple gives us a slider where we can change the index and then see what the plot of the nth Fibonacci polynomial looks like. So there's a clear pattern here that you can see. Uh, we already noticed before that 0 is the only uh, real positive uh, real root. <clears throat> In fact, it's the, uh, the, the only real root. So the geometry of the plot is not very interesting. We also can use the explore command to explore the factorization. So look at the factorizations in a different way. Instead of looking at all of them together, we can move the slider and see how the factorization changes. And that is the end of uh, my presentation. Thanks for listening.